so thank you very much for joining once again maharaj hare krishna chaitanya charan prabhu nice to be with you again so maharaj today uh, thinking we could discuss on the topic of uh, spiritual but not religious that okay and i broadly thought about three sections in which we could discuss it we you know what what is right about that idea what is deficient about that idea and how uh, the bhakti traditions the vedic traditions traditions wisdom can complement that deficiency so um, uh, especially in the western world the spirit, i'll start with the first part then what is right about that idea in my understanding so so the, the spiritual but not religious there are books written on this topic and uh, it's primarily an idea about deinstitutionalized spirituality so basically in spiritual uh, in religion there are two aspects there is we have the word orthodoxy so doxy refers to doctrine and there is another word praxy there is also orthopraxy praxy refers to practice so basically there are doctrines and there are practices which are sometimes negatively referred to as rituals so what the spiritual but not religious people as associate is that that by rituals and by doctor over doctrines and over rituals people have differences and people fight and that makes people narrow minded whereas <clears throat> they feel that if we are spiritual that means we have experiences and we have virtues a uh, spiritual person is so the lai lama is considered to be a classic example of somebody who is spiritual but not religious and he says that what is the essence of religion so it is it is compassion and kindness now these are virtues and then people talk even many people are open to some kind of mystical experiences the idea is i want to experience something higher and i would like to follow something which will make me more calm more kind more gentle <laughs> more more at be at harmony with myself so that people are open to but what they are so that three defining differences would be one is spiritual but not religious are people who are opposed to institution institutionalization of religion second is they are opposed to the sectarianism that comes because of because of particular dogmas and particular rituals which are often different in different religions and the third is that such people they feel that they want to follow their own path so i want to go spiritually but i want to follow my own path to spirituality rather than uh, the idea is there is a huge trust deficiency among people and they feel that if i commit myself to any particular path then that will lead to uh, i might be misled i might be bitten i might be manipulated so i will chart my own path and as i get my so i don't want dogmas i don't want rituals i want experiences and i want to develop my virtue virtues thereby so people are quite interested in spiritual leaders spiritual teachers spiritual gurus but they are not so much interested in religious institutions these are the broad three differences between spiritual or characteristics of people who identify themselves as spiritual but not religious yeah i think essentially if one looks at it um the whole movement of spiritual but not religious has originated in the west yes in the form that we see it today yes and i think it coincides with the rise of a new liberal philosophy that places excessive emphasis on individualism uh visa we collective <clears throat> and uh so in the pursuit of the goal of maximizing individual freedom mm-hmm. the restrictions that are placed by anybody else 
are unwelcome. Okay. So it is not only in the realm of religion. It is in any realm, whether it's a social realm, a religious realm, or even the official realm. Hmm. Now, people don't like restrictions. They want to express their individual freedom in whichever way they choose to. And any such restriction is not looked upon very well by a fair number of people who follow this kind of philosophy or an ideology. So I think one of the reasons why the spiritual but not religious, the SPNR movement, if one can call it a movement, <clears throat> is that they do not like the restrictions or the um, shall we say the uh, do's and don'ts that are imposed by organized religion. Because organized religions will always have a, a set of uh, do's and don'ts. There will be restrictions. There's something is called a sin, something is okay, you know, something is acceptable, something is not acceptable. You see, so I think that is one major reason. And also there is the, as, as you said, and I agree with that heartily, is that it is a kind of a protest against organized religion, institutionalized religion. Uh, and to a fair degree, such a protest has its uh, valid grounds. It's not completely baseless. Because organized religion or institutionalized religion does tend to become a little, uh, shall we say, mm, oppressive, suppressive, mm. stifling. And then there are certain authority figures who emerge who may always not be, you know, ideal. Yep. And also then, the moment you have a gathering of figures in an institution, even if for a spiritual purpose, but eventually the tendency of human beings in this material world is that the, the, uh, the way human dynamics works is that there will be a uh, struggle for control, struggle for power, for position, and these things happen, you know? And uh, so therefore that introduces, it is some kind of an unspiritual element into uh, the whole organization, into the whole religious practice, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and many, many other things creep in like this. Yes. So to, to some degree, I would agree uh, with the SPNR in terms of their uh, hesitation or reluctance or apprehension uh, with respect to institutionalized or organized religion. So I, also there is also perhaps a kind of despair or disappointment with, with religious leaders maybe quarreling or not setting a good example or whatever it is. And so they tend to lose faith. And because organized religion many times, not always, but many times, seems to give increased preference to the group vis-a-vis -vis the individual, Okay. Those who wish to express their individuality also want to do so on the spiritual realm. Mm. So increasingly you will find this uh, voice being expressed or this opinion that, well, I do believe in God, but I don't believe in religion as it is practiced and understood today. But it's just between me and God. So they don't like any intermediaries. They don't like anybody telling them anything. So uh, that, this is, I guess, the whole psychology behind why this has come up and the, um, the, the um, reasons why people have lost faith or trust in religious organizations. So as far as your first point of uh, what is right about it, I will say the basis in it is that religious organizations and institutionalized religion often tends to lose that individual spiritual uh, 
shall we say flavor that's true there are uh, that so i really touch yeah that's true and it's uh, at one level losing flavor is a uh, is is disappointing but what is often alarming is that institutions can also become perverted and uh, there are so the examples are given that in each of the three major religions how institutionalization has caused problem so with respect to christianity the catholic church and there is the child abuse scandal with respect to islam they said there is the extremism which is fomented by organizations religious extremism and violence with respect to hinduism there is a the caste system and the caste system is also an institution so now of course we could go into the specifics and that will be different subject but the point over here is they say that wherever religion has contributed to having a harmful effect on society that has usually been associated with institutionalization of religion and in that sense uh, the institutionalization is what they want to avoid and your point about the culture being individualistic that's that's very true i was at a interfaith conference in uh, washington dc and there was one christian pastor who said that he was on a uh, on a radio show and people were asking questions so there was this one one man came and he asked a question he said that i'm a, i'm a christian but i don't go to any church so uh, people have to be that even the preachers have to be very sensitive over this is can i know why don't you go to any church so he says i haven't yet found any church that agrees with my philosophy <laughs> <laughs> so the idea that rather than i go to rather than i going to find a way i want something which will sanction my way so what you said about not wanting to follow rules and regulations that is that is very true now one reason also is that often these rules and regulations may be presented without any proper rationale and so this is what you should believe and this is what you should do this is what you should believe and this is how you should behave and if that is it seems very didactic very domineering kind of thing but now in many ways eastern although eastern spiritual eastern spirituality is contrasted with organized religion although hinduism is a solid caste system but that is primarily in india as indian spirituality or eastern spirituality both the vedic as well as buddhism are seen they are to much as extent seen to be free from these problems because at one level so where it is all our belief believing and behaving that's how how christianity is portrayed uh, as you said this is primarily in the west so there the mainstream religion was christianity islam is there but it's not the mainstream so eastern spirituality is appealing because this is more about uh, more about say analyzing realizing it's so it's not that you have to believe this but you analyze maybe it's it's like this it's like that so atha in our in our sense atha to brahma jigyasa it is not a commandment do this or don't do this it's it's inquire explore and then there is also the concept of realization pratyaksha avagamam dharmam so in many ways the the people in the west who come to our moment uh, or who at least are open to exploring krishna consciousness are people who are of this spiritual but not religious orientation if they were already religious then probably they would join the the organization the, the religion of the organized religions of their particular then uh, their birth or their local ones so to some extent this trend also makes people receptive to eastern spirituality as contrasted with say western religion or its middle eastern religion which is now in the west so that that is also one from our perspective that receptivity is there now, most of the people who came to uh came to ishla prabhupad at that time the name spiritual but not religious was not there but they were of that they were they were spiritually inclined but they were not following anything at all so in that that is also one sense in which the openness is something which we can we can it, it opens an opportunity for us 
Yes, I think it's a combination of disappointment. <coughs> Beg your pardon. And disappointment with their own religious traditions mm. on one hand for various reasons, including that probably their traditions were not able to answer their deep philosophical questions or existential questions properly. There could be other reasons as well. So there's disappointment with their own religious traditions coupled with a certain mystique or a charm mm. with which they see Eastern religious traditions. There is almost that kind of stereotyped uh, you know, idea about Eastern religions. You see the yogi who is levitating or sitting on a carpet and you know, flying somewhere. You know, so you still have people perhaps who have some kind of notion like that, or at least that Himalayas, you know, the place of spirituality. India is the land of karma, of, and in the modern days, this is the level, you know, the land of, of uh, where the concepts of karma came about, and Ayurveda, yoga, you know, things the like that. The land of Buddha. The land of Buddha as well, yes. So the land of meditation, there's so many different types of meditation. So it's a combination of these two, I think, that makes uh, Westerners uh, come towards the Eastern religious traditions. Um, also, perhaps, it is uh, excessive materialism uh, has caused reactions, uh, and therefore they are tired of materialism, their traditions don't seem to give them satisfaction. And these religions appear very intriguing and very mystical. So uh, they're attracted towards, towards them. Also, as far as Hinduism is concerned, it's such a broad term. Uh -huh. You know, I don't even think that Hinduism is probably considered as an organized religion. Yeah, that is like true. That the Abrahamic faiths are considered, no? That's true, yes. Like Christianity, Islam, Judaism, they're definitely considered to be organized, institutionalized religion. Because there is a, a, there is a certain clear, defined set of rules. Of course, there are denominations within all of these, but within each denomination, very clear set of rules about what, what is what. And you have to abide by them. Uh, there are certain standards that have to be followed, yes, that are universally uh, applicable for all the followers. Uh, the other um, Indian religions, let's say, or religions that have originated in India, are Sikhism and Buddhism also perhaps to some degree are considered organized religion. Yeah, generally, I, about Hinduism, just one point that they... What in comparative religions, they say that Hinduism is very difficult to classify as a religion because it has no founding date, it has no founder, and it has no founding scripture. So these three, at least one or two or three of these are there. With Christianity we have, with Islam we have. Judaism, even if we don't say, we can call Moses as a founder, there are many prophets. But there are, there are one book, so yes. Hinduism is in many ways quite decentralized or diffused. And yeah, but Buddhism and Sikhism. Yeah. Sorry. Multiple strands of belief and practice yeah. of some variety that are not found in any of the other organized religions. Even though the other religions have uh, denominations and sects, but they lack the kind of extreme variety and diversity that is found. In, yes, uh, that is true. In, in so called Hinduism. So, I guess this is also a kind of thing that charms people. If you will see uh, the kind of uh, response that organized Eastern religions have got uh, in, um, in the Western countries, it has been relatively lower than the appeal that individual yogis and uh, you know, such. Um, mystics and so on have had, who are not yes. part of any organized thing. They have their own philosophy. They have their own set of practices. 
you know, each one has carved out his own niche, so to speak. His own understanding of what spirituality is. He has his own set of followers. And he probably doesn't have a particular scripture he looks at. You look at, you know, many of the uh, books today. They may be spiritual, they may not, they may believe in God, they may not believe in God, but they're seen as very mystical, spiritual creatures. Uh, I'm sorry, not <laughs> as personalities. Yeah. So it's because they, they, they don't say this is the book. It's because they, they have their own brand, their own charisma. It's mostly charisma oriented. Hmm. And also, in some cases, it may be because there is some kind of a mystic power or something that person has. You know, so the, the popularity of Eastern religion, of uh, let's say different sects within Hinduism, or by and large Hinduism in the West, has been these individuals. Mainstream, quote unquote, Hindu religion has not become so popular like that. Yes, that is true. If anyone has, has done it, it, it is Srila Prabhupada who did it in the sense that he had established temples where the people followed a certain standard routine, certain standard philosophy. There were standard fixed books. There were scriptures. There were certain mantras to be chanted. And, you know, so although we don't consider ourselves an organized religion in the sense that other religions are considered, Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur also distinguished between the two. So we do not consider ourselves organized religions in the sense that the others perhaps are. But still, if you look at it, we, we have temples, which an organized religion does. We have a set of scriptures which we believe in, which an organized religion does. We yes. have our main scripture, one or two or three of them, which are foundational, and others are essentially based on that. Then we have certain personalities. We have certain modes of worship. So we have all, all the uh, typical characteristics of what would be considered perhaps an organized religion, but Krishna consciousness is unique because what is taught, the philosophy that is practiced uh, is something quite transcendental, truly transcendental. It is based on this completely spiritual understanding that these other religious rituals and practices go on. So if anything, uh, the only uh, tradition, the religious tradition or spiritual tradition from India that has become really popular in the last 50 years or maybe 100 years or so is Krishna consciousness. Yes. Others, if you see, they're all individual based and they may not even uh, proclaim their connection to a particular uh, lineage, a spiritual lineage. Yes, that is true. Actually, Prabhupada was very, very particular to point out uh, that there must be a spiritual lineage going all the way up. <clears throat> yes, Maharaj. That's a beautiful point that in one sense we could say that uh, what we have within the Krishna consciousness movement is in some ways spiritual and religious. We have the, yes. we have the rituals we have we don't use the word dogmas we have the word philosophy we have the philosophy clearly defined canon of books but through that the stress is on developing virtues you now our regulative principles are meant to develop virtues of kindness cleanliness purity uh, compassion so like uh, austerity and then beyond that there is, there is the whole path of bhakti is in many ways the path of experiential spirituality it is meant to give us experience of Transcendence, experience of Krishna. So it is spiritual and religious both. It is spiritual and religious. <clears throat> yes, yes. Sometimes, you know, uh, this discussion happens amongst our own devotees. Uh, and I was asked this question also sometimes, that is Krishna consciousness a religion or not? Mm -hmm. Right? Because... <clears throat> 
And the reason for this is because Srila Prabhupada distinguished often between Krishna consciousness on one hand and religious faiths on the other hand. Yes. So, therefore, this has led many devotees to even question whether Krishna consciousness is a religion. So it's really about how you define the word religion you know, and mm. how you define the word spiritual. So in my discussion with this devotee that happened maybe a year or two ago, I asked the following questions. <clears throat> how would you say, what would you say a religion is characterized by? The same points you said, right? First of all, there is a belief in a certain supernatural power, God or gods, okay, generally. Mm. Second, there is some established, uh, commonly accepted set of norms and practices and rules and regulations that they all must follow. They must subscribe to a certain philosophical uh, point of view. <clears throat> Third, there are certain personalities whom they revere, who are the proponents or propagators of that particular faith. So there are certain books, there are certain people, there are certain beliefs, there are certain practices, right? And you, you can make a long list of them. So I said, let's look at Krishna consciousness. Do we have belief in a God? <laughs> yes. Do we believe in a particular book, a holy book or books? Yes. yes. Do we believe in certain very uh, exalted personalities as those who are propagators and uh, um, carriers, transmitters of this whole process? Yes. Do we all follow a certain set of codes of conduct? Do we have certain modes of worship? Yes. So yes, 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 yes. Everywhere there's yes. So how can we say we are not a religion? At the same time, we are not like a religion uh, where we just blindly follow something, where we are merely ritualistic, where we are not aware of the ultimate purpose of the religious or the ritualistic activities that are done. So we are very conscious all the time of the ultimate purpose of all these different beliefs and practices. <clears throat> I guess the difference between ordinary religion and Krishna consciousness, which we could call a spiritual religion, hmm. is that in ordinary religion, which also has a spiritual essence, but it is largely eclipsed. It doesn't come so much in the forefront. It is mostly eclipsed by the uh, materialistic identification with that particular community or that body or having taken birth in that kind of community or with certain modes of external modes of dress or, or appearance and forms of worship and, and so on. So it is more an external and to some degree a materialistic connection and orientation. <coughs> and that is how Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur defined organized religion. He said, I think uh, organized religion is that which <coughs> actually he used very strong words. He said something that evil manifests through uh, such organized religion. Yeah, he used the example he, of Putana. Yeah, like Putana, Putana, <clears throat> Putana right. comes to nourish, pretends to nourish Krishna, but she's actually coming to kill Krishna. So like that organized religion, yeah. yes. it, acts, it is meant to, the organization is meant to nourish, nourish the devotion of people's heart, but actually it poisons the devotion. Yes, and he said organized religions are basically those that <clears throat> Uh, are carriers of gross worldliness. Carriers of gross so, worldliness. Because I think they tend to uh, emphasize the materialistic aspect. There is, there is material identification. Whereas in Krishna consciousness, we tend to, <coughs> because of our philosophical understanding, 
not so much get into the materialistic identification, but with, a, with an identification with something that is beyond material designations and divisions. So I think therein lies the difference of an ordinary religion. By ordinary, I don't mean it in a demeaning way, hmm. but in the sense that people understand it often. <clears throat> And for us, we, we, we focus on the spiritual aspect of the religion. Yes. And many times we may kind of compromise with the, the externals and the rituals and we may adjust with them because the higher purpose is the essential spiritual purpose. Whereas when there is more preoccupation with the externals, Rather than the initial, the, the, the spiritual core of that religion, mm. then that religion becomes more of a, shall we say, an organized religion or a materialistic religion. <coughs> yes. <coughs> so now, in some sometimes it, this is, <coughs> sometimes it may happen that uh, it, we could say at one level. Every, every great tradition that started was a spiritual tradition. It was meant to spiritualize people's mm -hmm. consciousness. But over a period of time, accretions, various things get mixed up with it. And then to that extent, it becomes externalized. And there, is, there is a joke which said religion was a wonderful thing, but it did a terrible thing. And the terrible thing that it did was it got mixed with people. <laughs> it got mixed with people and then it got spoiled. So now it's not just people, it is institutionalization especially. So now on one side, institutionalization leads to, as you said, worldly preponderance or worldly <coughs> positions. But then in some ways, institutionalization is also <coughs> important. And in within, if we consider broadly the Indian tradition, if you look at uh, history, now yoga itself is quite old, even according to modern historians, it has been there at least for 2.500 years or more, because Buddha himself practiced something similar to yoga. So when you mentioned earlier about many of the Indian teachers in the West trying to deny their connection <coughs> with the broader, with the specific religion, so there there is now a big debate going on whether yoga is Hindu or not. And there are, there are Deepak Chopra and other teachers, they are trying to say that actually yoga predates the whole system of uh, uh, worship of various gods, which comprise <coughs> And that's how they, they are trying to make yoga appear non-sectarian because for many people now yoga is big business. And if yoga is associated with certain religions, then then they feel that those people cannot practice yoga. Now there are some people, some Christians who have adopted something called as Christian yoga. And there are others who say that, there are other Christian groups who say that yoga is actually a pagan practice and Christians should never adopt it. So to try to avoid that uh, challenge, there are some group of people who are saying that yoga predates in what we call as Hinduism. But there are, a, there are a group of activist Hindus who say that you are taking things from India, from the Hindu tradition, and you are not giving credit to that. So, uh, and that's, a, that's, that's in a sense, it's like poaching. So there is opposite. So they say that in the, while the West is benefiting from yoga, which comes from India, from the Hindu tradition, the portrayal of Hinduism is often just negative. Oh, these are the people who worship gods, so many, many, many gods, they are polytheists, <laughs> they have the caste system. So in that sense, there is that concern that if there is no institutionalization, then there is no structure and then it is open for interpretation or manipulation in many different ways. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I, I think you had made the point about the even though institutionalizing uh, of religion or spirituality has, has its problems, but there are also benefits and there is a need. 
to do that. And that is also a fact. Um, we see that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur who wrote so strongly against organized religion hmm. and compared it to the likes of Putana and Kamsa. But he himself founded the Gaudiya Mutt. Yes. And following in his footsteps, Srila Prabhupada founded the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. <clears throat> so if we understand that the objection to um, institutionalization is to the, uh, shall we say, the transformation of that group <clears throat> into something that doesn't resemble what the the pure teachings are mm. that the, the the organization does not truly represent that inner spiritual core it doesn't project that as its main uh, <clears throat> shall we say aspect and that worldliness takes over so Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur did set up the Gaudi Mart, Prabhupada did set up ISKCON, but then they all always cautioned against uh, making it a materialistic place. They cautioned against the materialistic mentality, mm -hmm. against the usual ills, the human frailties that plague any uh, human endeavor. And if you look at it, it is not that Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur was the first to start institutions. His father, uh, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, spoke about the Vishva Vaishnava Raja Sabha, and he took that idea from Srila Jiva Goswami yes. much before him. You see? And uh, so even before that, we see even in the other sampradayas, like Ramanujacharya started his Matha. Yeah, in fact, Shankaracharya is considered to be the founder of some kind of institutionalization within what we call as Hinduism. Because Correct. the Akhadas which he had, the groups, the Mathas which he started. Yeah. So prior right. to that, we didn't have so much. Or right. at least we don't have a historical record of that. But yes, it's almost uh, Shankaracharya was the 7th century. So it's almost 14 centuries. And Ramanuja was... Shankaracharya was, no, not 7th, 8th century. And Ramanacharya was 10th, 11th century. Yeah, about a, a thousand years ago, right. So yes. Ramanuja came just after Shankaracharya. Yes. But even before Shankaracharya, if you look at the tradition, uh, Buddhism, let's say, Buddha also made a kind of an institution. It was not yes. a very structured institution. It was more amorphous. Uh, for example, you'll find the Buddhist saying, you know, Sangam, Sangham Sharanam Gachami. Yes, that is true. Dham Sharanam Gachami, Dhammam Sharanam Gachami. So, I, Gachami, I go to take shelter of Dhamma, of that Dharma, the Buddhist Dharma. Or I go to take shelter of Buddha. Yes. And then Sangham Sharanam Gachami. Yes. So, Sangha. It refers to an institution. Yes, Maharaj. So it was a loosely knit institution, not uh, in, the, in the organized way that we find it today, but it was an organization nevertheless. Yes, definitely. Similarly, uh, so that's called a Sangha, which is an important point, I think, because uh, Sanghas have existed for a long time. And the, the, the purpose of the Sangha is to give Sangha, Oh, so there are two separate Sangha. terms. It's not just Sangha. Okay, Sangha and Sangha. Yeah, S-A-N-G-H-A okay. is the institution, Sangha in Sanskrit. And Sangha, S-A-N-G-A, that speaks the about the association of, you know, generally, of course, of saintly people. So the purpose of the Sangha is to enable uh, people to get Sangha. So, Srila Prabhupada said one time that the real reason he set up ISKCON was to give the association of devotees to the people of the world. Yes, that is true. But he set up this Sangha for the sake of giving Sangha. Yeah. So, institute, forming an institution is not bad, provided we uh, 
are careful uh, about the um, different problems that are associated with an institution, we steer clear of them, we take our precautions, and whenever we notice uh, those issues rearing their heads, then we can uh, take care of them. You know? So in that sense, I don't think there is a problem with an institution. On the contrary, it is essential. Yes, that's true. So long as we don't become overly bureaucratic, we don't become overly, uh, you know, uh, shall we say, um, impositional. Hmm. Yes. Although to some degree it must be there, otherwise what does it mean to follow? That's true. Now it's interesting you mentioned about Buddhism. Yeah, when I said our tradition within Hinduism, or what we call as Hinduism, Shankaracharya might have been the first. But within the broad Indian tradition, Buddhism definitely was has there. In fact, it is said that Shankaracharya adopted this Sangha or adopted this Akhadas, Mathas, primarily to, in some ways, counter the influence of Buddhism. So, and Buddhism had it because, in one sense, for Bu Buddhism began as largely a monastic religion. And monasticism means they would have a particular place, a monastery, and that monastery became the, the institution. So, and from that point, it's going on. But it's interesting that Buddhism, although in one sense, it is also an organized religion, it is not perceived with the same negativity as the other organized religions are. And that is possibly because it is, it is perceived as more open for getting ex viewing experiences and getting experiences. And uh, <clears throat> one metaphor I try to use for explaining this is the need for institutionalization as well as the danger of institutionalization is like a river and a river bed. You know, the river is basically the current of human consciousness, which is meant to go toward the divine. The divine is like the ocean. And each of us is like one small trickle at the top of a mountain. So for one of us, from the, for one trickle from the top of the mountain to go to the ocean, the chances are very less. But if many trickles come together, then those trickles form a stream. The stream forms a river. And then the river can flow forcefully toward the ocean. So basically, <coughs> and spiritually minded, People, people, people with spiritual inclinations, spiritual longings, some wanting to know God, to love God, they come together, then that is what is the river, that is the Sangha. Now for the, uh, for the river to flow smoothly, the river creates a river bed. And that river bed is the institution. So the river is the flow of consciousness towards the divine and the river bed is the institution. But the problem is, as soon as the riverbed is created, it's so much, when so much water is flowing, then there are self-interested people who come and maybe build a dam over there and divert the water elsewhere. So may, may, there may be many people who come to spiritual, come to a spiritual path or spiritual organization uh, for genuinely knowing God, but there are others who come for their ulterior motives. And once somehow they gain power, then they can block or divert the spiritual energy of people. And that's how some kind of uh, deviations or some kind of unwanted things can happen. So that if that vigilance is kept so that uh, the damming doesn't happen or the dams are broken whenever they happen, then, uh, then without the bed, the reverse reaching the ocean is much more difficult than with the bed. So without an institution for an average individual, even if that person has some spiritual inclination, to actually practice spirituality seriously and to make genuine advancement or to have authentic transformation alone is quite difficult. Right. You know, I'll just make one point relating to the earlier discussion about uh, institutions in the Vedic tradition. It didn't only start with Shankaracharya, actually. Okay. That is only in recent times. But uh, if you look at a Ramayana, for example, there were mathas there also. You know, okay. the 
last section, the Uttarakhand, you will see the dog who comes to see Lord Ram in his darbar. <coughs> you know, the whole story that he was previously a Mathadipati or the head of a Matha. Oh, a okay, Mathadipati, yes. So the idea of a monastery and therefore some degree of institutionalization was there, has always okay. been there. But uh, my understanding is that uh, these uh, things were rather loose set up. Apart from the monastery structure proper, institutionalization was rather amorphous. It was more open, you know, well yes. ventilated. Let's look at uh, Yasudev, you know, passing down or handing down the knowledge of the four Puranas and the various scriptures to his various disciples who then started their own schools. So there were sort of institutions, not in the sense that we understand them today. And they were very loosely knit, perhaps small, but they were institutions of sorts. So this has been there. And the point coming to uh, the, the uh, uh, point that you just made now, uh, you know, today in Kali Yuga, it is not possible for us to practice spiritual life on one's own. Therefore, all the more there is need for institutions. In the earlier ages, even though institutions existed, perhaps they were not as well structured and formally organized as they are today. Because in those days, it was quite possible for people to individually go to the Himalayas and then practice their spiritual life. And also, the, you may have stages who went into the forest and a few disciples followed him. And he lived in a kind of a small monastery there, leading a very reclusive life in the middle of the forest. So all of that was possible in those days. Uh, there was a whole culture of ashrams. There were forests that were called tapovana. You know, forests that were exclusively meant for such sages to go and reside in and perform their austerities and penances. So there was a whole such culture, uh, an, an ecosystem, an infrastructure, so to speak, an eco-infrastructure, and even a social infrastructure, because this was very much respected and, and part of the accepted culture. Today, in this day and age, it is very difficult to do that in Kali Yuga. So we need Sangha, association. And... You know, when Sangha comes, uh, as you rightly put it, then when more and more people come together, then you, you find the need. Automatically, you will find the need for a Sangha. Yes. You will find the need for some sort of organization to start over there. Let me give a simple example. Let's say there's one devotee, okay? He goes in the middle of some country where there's absolutely no Krishna consciousness, okay? Mm. Uh, and in all the countries around also there is nothing and let's say for argument's sake also that he's not connected with uh, mainstream is gone, he doesn't know he, he, somehow he just heard about it, he started preaching now he goes there he starts and people come around him and some people are attracted and they start following his teachings now the number of people grows. And then they find that they need a place to congregate because where do they have a place? He can't fit all in his home. So he has to have some place. So then, but that place then costs money. And then the more the people that come, then if you follow a philosophy, you have to uh, have forms of worship. You have to have literature. You have to have of prasadam, of sacred food, all of this costs money. It also costs, means there is a lot of intelligence that goes behind, uh, you know, printing that literature, behind distributing that literature, behind even allocation of the different responsibilities and services for doing that. Then all the more need for them, more money and more manpower, more organization of the different services and organization of resources. All of that comes up. And in the modern day especially, the moment you have money coming in and you have resources coming in, the government is in the picture. 
So, because it's public money you're dealing with, so therefore you must now submit your accounts to the government. <laughs> you are answerable to the government because you're taking uh, mm. money. So you have to make it into a, register it as a legal entity, right? So uh, you automatically, the moment your Sangha increases to increase the quality of the Sangha, in order to fulfill the very purposes for which that Sangha exists, you have to do it in a well-organized way. And therefore from Sangha, Sangha will automatically come. Some form of organization, however uh, limited or crude it may be in the beginning, eventually as it evolves, it must form a structured organization. Mm. It will. <clears throat> Look at any mainstream religion. At one point, it started with one man. Yeah, whether it's Christianity or whether it is uh, Islam, right, or even Buddhism, <clears throat> it started with one person, and then more and more people gathered around him. And as time passed, there was need felt to have a more organized <laughs> structure <laughs> around him. And therefore, in Christianity, then you had the Vatican, and then the Pope, and the whole hierarchy. Then in Islam, you had the Caliphs. You know, he came in so. So it has to come. It's an inevitable uh, outcome of the uh, pursuit of spirituality. Yes. Trying to pursue spirituality on one's own is extremely difficult, almost impossible. So you need Sangha, Sangha needs Sangha. So you can't avoid institutionalization. Even those people who are averse to uh, institutional religion, if they continue on like this, uh, eventually if they start congregating together, they, they will make their own organization. Yeah. They may, may not live together but, uh, for long, then there'll be splinter groups that come off. Okay, so uh, it has yes, to happen. Yes. It's inevitable. You can't avoid it. And there will be some who will always be there doing their own thing, so to speak, individually, just pursuing their own path. People who are, uh, let's say, dabbling, sometimes go to this one, sometimes that one, sometimes with this mystic, sometimes that yogi, sometimes this teacher or that. There are some who may be, uh, who may eventually get to identify with that particular, you know, sect or a group and start doing that. Hmm. So, you know, it's to some degree inevitable. Yes, that's true. I was just thinking about this point itself that in institute, that some kind of having structure or resources or infrastructure for practice of whatever we are practicing, that is required. So one reason why Buddhism is not seen as an organized religion is, although it has a monastery and it has a certain structure, the, the, it is not so much the physical structure that people recoil against because in some ways even spiritually minded people they appreciate say going to rome and looking at the beautiful cathedrals or coming to india and looking at the magnificent temples and they consider that beholding these as spiritual experiences it's not so much the physical structures as the structuring of beliefs and structuring of rituals and this is what you should believe and this is how you should behave that is where the institutionalization is pursued in a way that seems restricted for people. And we have whenever, for example, in the Christian tradition now, baptism is considered important, but there, there are big conflicts among different sects about how baptism is to be done. Whether the head is to be dunked or something, water is to be sprinkled. And there have been big conflicts now with respect to Protestants and Catholics. The conflicts were uh, primarily on doctrines. Now, do we accept the Trinity? Do we accept Virgin Mary or not? So the, the aversion to institutionalization is not so much to the infrastructure for practicing, but it's more to the, uh, to the ordering of uh, beliefs and rituals, which eventually leads to sectarianism. And um, that was just one point I had. And then I have one more point, but would you like to speak something about this? Then I'll move on. 
Let's see, even about Buddhism, the, what you are referring to is only the Tibetan Buddhism made popular by the Dalai Lama. Okay. Okay. Now, generally, in Buddhism, what do you have? You have things like the Eightfold Noble Path, which essentially tells you to be virtuous. And there are those steps of what you have to do. And that's kind of attractive. It's nice. Uh, you know, especially the emphasis on non-violence. It appeals. It appeals to people with some degree of refined intelligence. Uh, because it's indicative of some uh, progressive, you know, kind of a thinking or culture. Uh, and also, in Tibetan Buddhism, there is a lot of mystique attached to to that, you know, the in the Himalayas, and there's something very mystical, and those mystical chants, and, uh, you know, plus it's not something where the, you impose many types of restrictions on your life. That is true. There are not too many types of rituals to be done in your home. It's just a kind of meditation, and the meditation is also many times not very structured. It's a kind of a, you know, vague kind of meditation. So because of that, the, the vagueness of it and the looseness of it and the charm of it, the mystique of it all uh, combines to make it attractive. Mm. But if you look at other countries where Buddhism is the predominant religion, whether it is Sri Lanka or Myanmar and such places, uh, they tend to also act or respond to situations like just like any other religious group would do. Hmm. Uh, and that has been in the news over the last few years. So, with, you know, because they're the majority and so there are issues in every country of some sort. So, there are people who are critical of that aspect also because now it has become an organized religion there. Perhaps the way that the Dalai Lama presents it, it's not that much of a kind of an oppressive or something mm. that is uh, to be identified with in a, in a material sense. You know, so I guess that's some points about Buddhism. <coughs> yes, Maharaj. That's also very, yeah. uh, you know, kind of, uh, it appears non-sectarian because there's no particular God. You don't ascribe to, you know, say Krishna or Ram or Allah or it's a kind of a voidist kind of philosophy. Ultimately everything is zero. So it's kind of appealing to people of a certain intellectual type mm. because they don't like um, worship in the traditional sense, worship of a God, going to a church, going to a temple or a mosque or something like that. So here is something where you don't believe in a God even, actually. Yeah. And it's something where the philosophy is ultimately nothing exists. So it's a kind of, a, you know, thing that intellectually may appeal to many people. Whereas, uh, say, if you go and tell people Krishna is a supreme personality of Godhead, they may feel that you are sectarian because you're talking about a Hindu God or you're talking about a particular form of God, or you say God has a particular name, or even that God exists. So these other kind of things are, are more easier to digest for certain kinds of people who have been uh, brought up in, in, in the modern era. That's right? definitely. Mm. And it's valid that uh, Buddhism has many different variants. In fact, if we consider in India, Buddhism was more adopted as a political move by Ambedkar. And this Buddhism actually has very little to do with Buddha. In a sense, it is, uh, yeah, so there are very different variations. And there's one version that has become popular. Now, another point about the institutions, when you're mentioning that, um, institutionalization is required and even the hermitages in the Ramayana there are also some kind of institution that in sociology of religion they talk about three degrees of institution or organization they call it soft core medium core and hard core 
So, and basically it is said that Gaudiya Vaishnavism itself began as soft core. So soft core means that there is a general understand, general agreement about the, about the object of worship. But beyond that, there is, there is variety. So for example, after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu departed, then there are three broad places, Uttal, Orissa, and then Mayapur, Bengal, and Vrindavan, where his followers were prominently there. And in the, in the, his followers evolved in their own way. There are the different kinds of Kirtan, Narutam Das, Chakur, Kirtan style, other had the Kirtan style. So there was, they all worshipped Lord Chaitanya and worshipped Krishna as Lord Chaitanya taught. But beyond that, there was a broad scope for individuality or, or localization, we could say. That's soft core. Then medium core is where there is uh, some central authority which, impo which mandates certain broad theological and uh, liturgical, liturgical is practical, practices of religion, theological, liturgical boundaries, parameters. And then the hardcore religion is, or hardcore institution or organization is where practically everything is determined by a central authority. So, uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur in our tradition, Jiva Goswami conceptualized the Vishwavishnava Raj Sabha. Uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur developed the constitution, uh, concept further, uh, but he also had his, uh, he, was, uh, he was working and he did not really have the time, have the resources, the bandwidth to implement it. So Bhakti Sanat Thakur was the person who implemented it and Srila Prabhupada carried it forward. So what they implemented is more of a, a medium core, not so much a hard core, because if we consider Prabhupada instituted ISKCON in such a way that each temple is almost independent in its own way. There are broad agreements which have to be followed. So to some extent, soft core or medium core is, is what is, will be required. But when it becomes a little hard core where everything is mandated and there is not much room for uh, adaptation to local needs or requirements, then that is where the problem comes up. So just one point with this. The, one of the reasons they say Christianity has spread so far now Christians also, there are many Christians who try to prove who we are actually spiritual but not religious and that we are universal. So they say that Jesus recommended the singing, singing the praises of God, but he did not mandate any language. He did not mandate any particular, uh, he did not tie Christianity to a particular, uh, particular specifics. And that is why... Uh, it could spread across the world and it could reach many, many people. And, and now this is, of course, the Christians contrast this with Muslims. They say Islam is very much tied to the Arabic culture. And, and in some ways, wherever people follow Islam, to some extent, they are expected to follow some things about Arabic culture. And now in our tradition, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's followers went to Manipur, and they made Manipur into Vaishnava state. Still, the Manipuri Vaishnavas, they had their own culture. They had their diet, they had their Kirtan style, they had their dance way, they had their dress. So this is some and, um, indication that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not mandate a hardcore kind of religion. It was more of a soft core or his followers made it to a medium, medium core. Just a few thoughts. I think that is a point of discussion See, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very, very particular about the proper understanding and dissemination of the correct Siddhanta. Yes, that is true. A philosophical conclusion. So he took great pains to explain it to his chief followers, mm -hmm. like uh, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, Swarup Damodar, uh, Rup and Sanatan Goswamis, and so on. And uh, it was they who faithfully then transmitted it ahead. 
Rupan Sanatan wrote books. Sarup Damodar didn't write books except for his notes. Um, but otherwise, these followers basically spoke or wrote and propounded the clear Siddhanta of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yes. Now, there are episodes that we can see from Chaitanya Charitamrita where uh, Mahaprabhu himself and his followers like Sparup Damodar were not at all pleased when somebody spoke something that was upper Siddhanta, that is, it was uh, that in which there was a wrong conclusion. And there are several instances like this that we can see in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So there were people who, like Swarup Damodar, who were designated to filter out these things. Mm. So there were devotees who were senior, who, was, who were kind of watchdogs to see that the wrong kind of philosophical conclusions would not infiltrate into the community of devotees. Mm. So they were guardians. Watchdog is perhaps not the right word. I, I take, you know, it may be misunderstood. I would say guardians. The guardians of, of the faith, of the philosophical conclusions, right? To ensure that uh, people don't come and pollute the pure teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with their own ideas, because that is the human tendency to start speculating and to, to try something new and to introduce something else into the philosophy. And despite all the alertness yeah. of the Acharyas there, still we find that there were certain dark periods in, in the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism at several at times, you know, and fortunately, uh, sooner or later, some of the other great Acharyas came along. Mm. Right after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then the six Goswamis were there, they were holding aloft the banner of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and Jayanava Mata was the, considered the leader of all the uh, Vaishnavas. And then gradually, then there came Narutam Das Thakur, you know, before that, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. And then as it went on to uh, Balade Vidya Bhushan, before him, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Then again, there was a gap. Then Bhakti Vinod Thakur came along. So at each time, uh, in between these phases, there were dark phases where uh, many people entered and presented the wrong ideas. Therefore, these upper sampradayas, the Yes, uh, Allah, un Allah, the, the unauthorized yes. liars, they kind of came in. So, Aula, Baula, Karta, Bhaja, and Prakrita Sahajiyas, and so on and so forth. So, at the time of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, he identified 13 such upper sampradayas. So, there could be uh, others that, that form in, in, in the course of time. So, there was a monitoring. There was a system to identify it. There were benchmarks. And there were devotees who, whose function it was, or whose sacred responsibility it was, to safeguard uh, the community of devotees or the Sangha, and indeed the informal Sangha, mm. from uh, corruption with the wrong philosophical conclusions. So, but at the same time, it was a loose-knit kind of thing. Yes, that's true. The Gaudiya Mat or Iskon is much more structured, much more formal. For example, today in Iskon, uh, if somebody were to go around Iskon temple speaking philosophy that was completely wrong, sooner or later he would be stopped. Somewhere it would get noticed and then he would be prevented from giving, prohibited from giving classes. So the institution serves this useful, useful purpose that it also protects the integrity and the purity of the teachings, the original teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or whoever is the, the Acharya. So for the Sri Sampradaya, it is Ramanuja Acharya's teachings and so on. So the institution serves that valuable purpose. And this valuable purpose is not available to those who follow the SPNR system because uh, they, they will just do whatever they like. Yeah, that's true. This preservation is such an important point. 
and even the so even if the church says that christianity is not tied to a particular culture but they have their uh, they have their authorities who try to protect in fact they in, in the catholic church when books are published they have something called imprimatur that this book does not consider contain any harmful doctrines and they want to give such authorization and say author seek that authorization in fact in the so 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 institutionalization is needed earlier you talk for for an individual to practice given the world's current is so different and opposite it is required for an individual to practice it's also required for the individual to have something pure to practice otherwise the tradition may not be available at all and if we use the word institutionalization in the sense of some kind of regulation being created then without that it won't be yeah it will be like a free for all it will laissez faire and there will be nothing left for people to practice and become purified yes so this brings us into a territory that is perhaps uh, relevant to your second point the question which you started our discussion with the first point was where uh, spnr is right yes the second point you raised was where it is deficient yes that is true so we are more or less talking about that so i think the important question to, to the topic to discuss now is this that it is possible to be religious without being spiritual okay there are many people who are ritualistically religious yes they may follow the rituals of their religious faith very assiduously but they do not understand the inner spiritual core teachings and neither uh, and because of that uh, it it has not resulted in much transformation in their heart and in their character in their attitudes in the ways of looking at life in their world view and so on there is not not been much purification let us say so because they look at the externals they look at the rituals they look at uh, their bodily identification with a particular faith as being the primary thing so it is indeed possible to be religious without being spiritual and perhaps that is one reason why the spnr category has yes but also i think the question that needs to be asked is is it possible to be spiritual without being religious hmm the first question is a very clear yes is it possible to be religious without being spiritual yes and we we would see many many examples all over in various religious communities and faiths but what is really relevant to our discussion on on sbnr is can you really be spiritual without being religious so what does it mean to be spiritual let's talk about that what how would we define being spiritual what is spirituality we 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 did speak briefly about what it means to be religious or what a religion is a religion is one that uh, believes in a particular divinity in a particular god there are certain set customs and traditions to follow there are processes of worship to follow there are codes of conduct there are sets of books that must be accepted there are personalities who must be followed who come in some kind of a hierarchy or a lineage of some sort okay so there are uh, also institutions that are formed as a result of that so that is religion as we understand it so what is spirituality how would we really define spirituality okay that is the question that we have to address yes yes generally it's a very important point now i often talk about like a four quadrant structure where on the x axis is religious y axis is spiritual 
so we can have people who are not spiritual not religious so they are materialistic so people who are religious but not spiritual people who are religious but not they'll be ritualistic then we have people who are if there are spiritual but not religious so basically it is usually they are sentimental or quite relativistic i'll come to that and then the fourth quadrant is spiritual and religious which is actually transformational so the word spiritual from what i've seen it has three different senses one is many people use spiritual as a referring to some state of mind anything that makes me feel good anything that makes me feel calm so they feel oh i went to that hill station and i saw that sunset if i felt so spiritual about it so spiritual is at one level thought of as associated with calming emotions it's a state of it's a state of mind now from the bhagavad gita's perspective spiritual refers to a, a level of reality there is material reality and there is spiritual reality there is matter and spirit so it's not just a state of mind but it's a level of reality different from our normal level of reality now the word spiritual is also used in sometimes in the first sense itself but i'll just repeat that that uh, that it's in terms of motivation energy this is the spirit of the country this was a uh, so this was the so for example independence was not for many people it's not just a more political struggle it is also a spiritual struggle it felt that the spirit of india will be awakened so spirit refers to energy or driving vision something like that again it's associated with emotions but spiritual uh, also refers to spirituality and also refer to a process so it's a state of mind it's a level of reality it's a driving energy and it's a process by which one attains a higher level of reality so for most people that means one metaphor i use is that if there's a bottom of the mountain top of the mountain so that the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness uh then the process which will take us from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain that also is spirituality so it depends on what context somebody is using now when people talk about in the general sense the spiritual they generally refer to it in the second sense that it's like a state of mind so i am i hope op- i'm open to the experience i get some experiences which make me feel connected which make me feel calm which may make me feel blissful and then also some virtues are developed through that so can we be spiritual without being religious i can go into that but would would you do you have any other points about what the word spiritual or spirituality means yes actually the word spirituality today uh has many vague connotations yeah and just as you know um uh, it is confused with piety in some cases people think to give to perform philanthropic or altruistic activities is being spiritual that's one school of thought some people think like that that this is a spiritual activity hmm uh some people think of spirituality as uh some kind of an uh supernormal or an extraordinary kind of an experience yeah uh, kind of it difficult to define uh difficult to describe but some kind of an emotion you know and there are various other such conceptions of spirituality and the problem with such definitions or understandings of spirituality is that they are vague number one mm-hmm. there is no clarity there and number two uh, they confuse the material with the spiritual for example altered states of consciousness can easily be achieved and are achieved by various types of intoxicants mm. so when shri prabhupad went to america uh, he did encounter the hippies who were 
and many of them and some of their thought leaders, so to speak, uh, who are also on the forefront uh, propagating uh, various types of hallucination, hallucinate, hallucination-inducing drugs, which they perceived as being spiritual. Yeah. So, you know, they, they confused an intoxicated state of mind as being a spiritual experience. So, uh, the, uh, this kind of problem arises. Or even ideas of seeing, let's say, good music or seeing a beautiful sunrise or a sunset, and that's such a spiritual experience. So they're confusing the mind and confusing the mode of goodness with spirituality. So essentially the problem with these understandings or definitions of spirituality is that they confuse the material with the spiritual and they are characterized by a lack of clarity of understanding of what really the word spiritual is. They're just vague understandings. Uh, if I were to define spirituality in a simple way, it's still very hard to make it very simple, but I'll try to make it as simple as possible. I think I agree with you that it is a process. I would say it is a process by which one understands one's true nature as an eternal spirit soul which is beyond the body, mind, and intelligence. Mm. And it is also the process by which one acts in accordance with such an identity, an understanding of the identity. And it is also the experience that follows such actions. So essentially, I am, I am including in this definition without stating it overtly, the Sambandha, Abhidheya, and Prayoja, by which all Vedic knowledge has to be understood. Yes, so Sambandha means understanding who we are and uh, who is Krishna, what is the material world, and what are the interrelationships between this. Abhidheya is the process, the actions that take place in accordance with that. And Prayojana is the experience, is the result of, of acting in that particular way. So I would say spirituality, first of all, uh, means that there must be a clarity and correctness in the understanding of one's true identity as an eternal spirit soul who is beyond matter, who is beyond body, beyond mind, being beyond intelligence. So that's the first part of the definition. The second part is you just don't stop there. You don't restrict yourself to an intellectual understanding of your true identity. Then at the next level, you want to also act on that platform of that identity. Mm -hmm. And the third part is what happens when you act in a certain way, there is a certain result or there are certain results. There are experiences that come as a result of such actions. So then the, uh, the spirituality includes the relishing of such experiences as well. But I distinguish such experiences from the experiences that are vague and that may be induced by drugs or by some vague form of meditation or something like that. So therefore, th this, is, this I would say is a threefold definition of spirituality. And therefore, if anybody says that he or she wants to be spiritual without being religious, my humble opinion would be uh, it is not possible. Because religion implies some degree of uh, authority. That knowledge must come from an authorized source. It's not something that I can speculate about or I can just concoct. So I cannot concoct my ways of meditation because spirituality in the modern uh, world is understood as being some type of meditation. It's synonymous with meditation, but what constitutes meditation exactly is not clear. And everybody has different uh, understandings of what the word meditation implies. For us, Srila Prabhupada was very clear about what you know, meditation meant. So, Therefore, 
without having some uh, concrete and very clear and authentic source of information on what constitutes spirituality and how one can become spiritual and what one can expect if one actually becomes spiritual, everything else will be just speculation and concoction. There may be some areas of overlap between their concocted version of spirituality and the authentic spirituality, but that may be only coincidental. So what is the basis? What is the foundational platform on which they base their spirituality? There has to be, it can't be something whimsical. It has to be something authentic. If there is a method for doing anything in life, for being a doctor, there is a method. For cooking a meal, there is a method. You can experiment with different methods, but still there are certain types of protocols to be followed. You may vary your dishes, you may vary the ingredients, but there are certain logical steps to be followed in cooking any dish. So similarly, in spirituality, why should spirituality be even if it's an individual experience, which it is, there is a subjective element there, a very strong subjective element there, but it has to be based on some objective criteria which are imparted by some superior source. It cannot be something that is uh, just devised by the, uh, you know, by our own fertile brains, <laughs> right? That's true. So therefore, uh, to, to conclude, I would say that it is not possible to be genuinely spiritual without being religious. And I clarify the meaning of the word religious being as something that is coming from the Supreme Lord, who is the original spiritual being, something that is transmitted in a bona fide succession of great teachers, something that is based on the foundations of a philosophy that is given in certain authentic books that come from that supreme being and which is commented upon and explained by the teachers in the succession. And then they describe various other methods or processes to follow. That constitutes religion. And religion has, as I said before, uh, at the beginning, at its core, a spiritual essence, which is the purpose. Yes. So to conclude, therefore, I feel it is definitely possible to be religious without being spiritual. And that is the case with many people. But truly speaking, it is not possible to be spiritual without being religious. Yes. You know, another... What he said is true. Another way of looking at it could be you mentioned cooking. If we consider medicine or health, you also mentioned that. To say that I want to be spiritual without being religious is like saying I want to be healthy without taking any treatment. If if we are somebody sick right now, then you have to follow some treatment. And of course, the treatment yes. has to be authorized. So if people associate the word religion with narrow-mindedness and intolerance and fanaticism, then yes, we don't have to be religious in that way. But if you use the word religious in the sense of being committed to a process, just like, uh, like somebody may say that, you know, I have been exercising religiously every day. So that the word religious is associated with certain commitment. So in that sense, religious is required. Because even if one wants to, if we so equate spirituality with some virtues, some experiences of a higher reality, how are we going to develop them? How are we going to attain those experiences? Sometimes I might be very calm and composed and sometimes I might just get very angry. Because the anartha of anger, the, the human fallibility or human failing of anger is still there within my heart and I have not purified myself of it. So if I want to be consistently forgiving, I need to follow some process by which my heart gets cleansed. And that process which we follow for purifying and elevating our consciousness, that is in a sense religion. So if, an, if, uh, if somebody refuses to follow that, 
then it's going to be very difficult for them to move from a from a disease state to a healthy state so somebody might have occasional spiritual experiences even if they are not religious somebody might go to a place like vrindavan somebody might come to a come a beautiful sacred architecture they might see they might come to a kirtan and they might experience something spiritual so a, a sporadic spiritual experience might be possible without being religious but if one wants to have a steady steady spiritual experience or a steady spiritual state of consciousness then one has to follow a process an authorized process that transforms the heart so yes. Yes. in that sense we need to be spiritual and religious so yes. <clears throat> often then if the difference is, sometimes what i find is if we say directly that you cannot be spiritual without being religious people have a very strong negative connotation of religion and i want to be spiritual i don't want to be religious so now that negative connotation was not there even a few decades ago now einstein and other scientists as einstein is quoted that the sciences the arts and the religions are all roots of the same tree are all fruits of the same tree of human knowledge so the word religion didn't have that negative connotation but now it has got a significant negative connotation so maybe a qualifier of what we mean by religion that some process has to be followed some authorized process for transforming the heart so if one says without following any process i will become spiritual that is not possible but can we while following a process be open minded yeah that's possible you know we can follow a process and we can acknowledge that there are other processes which also may be valid this is where another point we could say that krishna consciousness has a strength over other paths the christianity at least mainstream christianity says jesus is the only way and that strikes people as narrow minded but we can say that we are committed to following this path just like there can be ayurveda there can be allopathy there can be naturopathy there can be homeopathy there can be different treat methods of treatment so these all can work but if one has to grow one has to become healthy one has to follow one process diligently so we as uh, within our bhakti yoga tradition we can be religious and still be broad minded we can be committed to our process while also respecting that there may be there are other processes which can also elevate people's consciousness so we can be open minded and still be committed any thoughts on this sure. sure definitely uh it is very important that we explain what real or true religion is yes because of the way the word religion is understood by people today and the way it has been represented uh, today and even for centuries before this uh, people are often averse to the very mention of the word religion and therefore they would rather not have anything to do with it but i think it is our duty to explain what true religion is based on the bhagavad gita and shrimad bhagavatam then i think that issue would be resolved earlier there were used the two words spiritual and religious were used more or less more or less synonymously you know mm. and uh, one thing i would say here also is that um in the process of being spiritual there are there is a transformation there is a kind of a progression shall we say from being religious to spiritual if at all you make a distinction between religious and spiritual what makes religious transform into spiritual okay now if you consider religion as being the performance of certain activities the acceptance of certain uh, beliefs right and certain personalities and books etc etc and it requires a certain commitment to that we use the word commitment mm. so that is indeed correct so the first part of being uh, religious is that and that holds also for one who wants to be spiritual because you must have some degree of commitment 
but I would take things two steps forward. Mm. And I would say that commitment is necessary, but not sufficient. Because commitment or consistency, consistency means you keep doing it, right? Mm. If you are committed, you will do something consistently. So commitment and consistency is, is, is the step, first step, but it's, even though it's important, if you remain at that level without the other two levels that I'm just about to mention, then it will just remain religious and not spiritual. But what is needed to make that religion transform into its pure essence of spirituality is when you add two things. One is the proper understanding or the conception of those practices and why are you committed to this? You're committed to doing a particular thing. What's the purpose behind it? What exactly is it that I'm doing? For example, I was hearing Srila Prabhupada's conversation in 1973 in London with some gentleman and somehow the topic of a certain politician, a political leader, very well-regarded political leader uh, in India came up who was part of the uh, political freedom struggle of India. And uh, he was known as a very devout person and uh, he regarded the Bhagavad Gita very highly. Um, Prabhupada appreciated many things about him, his, his uh, philosophy for uh, economics and village self-sufficiency, etc. He very much appreciated that. Although when it came to his spiritual understanding of the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada said that he didn't have the proper understanding of Bhagavad Gita. So because somebody asked him the question that, did he go to Goloka Vrindavan, or rather, he, did he go to the spiritual world, not Goloka Vrindavan? Did he go to, to the spiritual world because he said to have chanted the name of Lord Ram at the time of his death? Mm. So Prabhupada made this important point that he was pious because he was constantly or he was very often chanting the name of Ram for a long time, for many, many years. So definitely, unless one is pious, one cannot do that. And by doing that also, one becomes pious. But, Prabhupada said, he did not have clear understanding of Ram. Hmm. Now, what I'm saying now is not what Prabhupada said further, but I'm just elaborating on what I think Prabhupada meant by saying he didn't understand what Ram meant. So, probably Prabhupada meant to say that he didn't understand that the name of Ram is non-different from Ram, number one. Probably he didn't understand that Ram is a supreme personality of Godhead who is ultimately a person. He's not just something impersonal, not just some spiritual light. Probably he didn't understand very clearly that when Ram descends into this world, he comes in his self-same spiritual body. It's not that the impersonal has taken on a material form called Ram. That Ram is not just a superhuman you know, uh, person who is by the uh, philosophy of anthropo anthropomorph anthropomorphism considered God. So there are so many misunderstandings. So to have the correct understanding of Ram means to be freed from all these misconceptions and misunderstandings and being correctly situated in one's mind on who Ram is or who Krishna is, what is Ram's name, what is Krishna's name. So that understanding or the correct conception is also very necessary to make that uh, transformation from religious into its spiritual essence. Right? Mm -hmm. And even that is not sufficient to my mind. What you also need is a correct consciousness. For example, someone may know that um, Krishna is a supreme personality of Godhead, he's spiritual, and you know, all that we believe in, that we understand from the Bhagavatam and Gita as presented by Srila Prabhupada uh, to us. But if let's say I start worshipping Krishna 
for some material purpose. Or I start chanting the holy name for some position, some name and fame, some prestige or something like that. Mm. So then that is a corruption of the original pure spiritual process. So to the extent that I introduce some uh, selfish desires, some material desires into that process, I have materialized it. I have made it materialistic. So to that degree, it has now come just to the point of religion and not spirituality. So I would say that to make the process of religion uh, become completely synonymous with spirituality, there must be not only commitment to the process and consistency in following the process, number one, there must also be uh, the proper understanding, the proper conception of the philosophy and the application of that philosophy. And number three, it must all be done with the correct pure consciousness devoid of any selfish interest. And because Krishna consciousness, the definition of uttama bhakti, you know, anya vilashita shunyam, jnana karma dhyanavritam, anukuliyana krishna anushilanam bhakti ruttama. And with this, I think we come to the third point you have raised right at the beginning of the talk as to where bhakti comes in to resolve this kind of a contradiction or an apparent a divergence between religion and spirituality. And the process of uttama bhakti, the concept of uttama bhakti, as defined by Srila Rupa Goswami, really harmonizes the two. Here is the perfect uh, blend, or shall we say, confluence of religion and spirituality. It is religion because you're believing in a supreme personality of Godhead. It's religion because it is anu shilanam, anu referring to following the Acharyas, mm. you don't know it whimsically. Anu also refers to the fact that you're consistently doing it. Shila number mm -hmm. refers to certain practices, I think and therefore you have yeah. commitment. But it's not a vague commitment, it is to Krishna. It has to be, and consciousness comes in in terms of Anu Kulyena, something very favorably done to please Krishna. Mm. Not with, and, and also then the idea of uh, being uh, free from uh, karma and jnana. Hmm. So I think this one verse encapsulates the perfect confluence and the harmony of religion and spirituality. So this verse. Now, there's also one more point which just came to me that in the bhakti understanding, a religion is not just a process to get to spirituality. And that is, religion also, in a sense, continues at the spiritual level. We chant the names of Krishna now yeah. and we chant them after eternally. But it is with greater attraction, greater absorption. So, all of us... Yes, the religion blends into spirituality and becomes one with it when it reaches its essence. And at that perfectional stage, certain other aspects of religious practices may be given up because of one who has attained the perfection, but still the, the, he, will, he or she will continue to do the other practices. Mm, okay. Right? Then we have to start on the spiritual journey by becoming religious. And then as we keep practicing religiously, or keep practicing the religion, the spirituality will start increasing. So the, yes. the, the commitment, the proper conception will come, the proper motivation will come, proper, yes. uh, and then, in a sense, this whole verse is about bhakti, so it's, it culminates in devotion or love, which is the ultimate spiritual experience. So the essence of spirituality is that, like earlier we talked about the vagueness, but in our tradition, the essence of spirituality is like a very 
not a vagueness, but a very vivid and vibrant love for Krishna, which manifests in many tangible transformations. There can be many different kinds of spiritual experiences, but the experience of Krishna is considered to be the highest experience. And so the, when the process of religion followed with commitment, followed with proper conceptions, and followed with proper uh, motivations, so conception is more of how we view the reality. Motivation is ultimate reality. And motivation is why do I want to approach that reality? And then when we do that, then we will experience that love for Krishna. And that can, for a devotee, it's a constant and constantly increasing experience. So Anandam Budivardhanam, as it said, the ocean of joy which is also increasing. So then at that point, one becomes purely, one doesn't give up religion, but one, in a sense, transcends any of the sectarianism or narrow-mindedness or any of those things that are associated with, uh, with certain attachments to externals. Like Bhakti Nautaku talks about the uh, Saragrahi and the Bharavahi. One who is the essence seeking and one is the burden carrying. So the more one actually experiences spiritual state, then many of the contradictions, you know, this is right, this is wrong. So those sort of things get transcended. So if, uh, now to, in a sense, to round off the discussion, just a couple of questions and maybe you can respond. About them, I'll also add a few things. That um, So in today's world, when people have the apprehension that religion is used for materialist purposes or religion is used to manipulate me, religion is used for, or organized religion is used for abusing, and I want to have my space and my individuality. I want to grow spiritually, but I don't want to lose my individuality. So that fear of loss of individuality, uh, how does the bhakti tradition address that? Well, I think the bhakti tradition is just the perfect tradition that balances the need for individual experience and the collective um, spirit. Responsibility, you could say. or Yeah, I mean the collective spirit in the sense of being in the association of devotees and serving the devotees, hearing from them, right, serving Krishna in their association. You know, so the, the progress, the individual is, is tied up with the collective. All the bhakti is a very, very intense, subjective spiritual experience. It is very much also related to the environment. Environment, I mean, of the devotees around us. So if you look at the great prayers of many devotees, uh, they, in the Bhagavatam and elsewhere, they say, we just want to serve the devotees. And if, there are cases when the Lord has appeared in front of them and said, what benediction do you want? I just want to serve your devotees, your pure devotees. That's what I want. Hmm. So therefore, it shows that even though bhakti is a very subjective experience, it is not to be seen in isolation. It is not something to be done in, in solitude. It is something that very much essentially is connected to a kind of a group activity. And therefore the process for perfection in this stage is Sankirtana, Samyak Kirtana. Bahubhir Milipa Kirtayati Iti Sankirtanam. So when many people come together and glorify the Lord, it is Sankirtanam. And the word Samyak indicates perfection. So glorification of Krishna is a spiritual activity if it is done in the proper consciousness, in the proper method and so on, in a bona fide way. And that becomes even more perfect when it is done collectively. So, so Bhakti blends the individual and the collective in the most perfect way together. Beautiful. So it is neither completely individualistic 
and neither is it completely uh, you know uh, neither does it completely disregard the individual and just place emphasis on the collective mm. and before i forget uh, i i mentioned one verse right uh, the anyabhilashita shunyam verse as a verse that really harmonizes religion and spirituality and there's another verse that comes to my mind which also does the same which is um savai punsam paro dharmo yato bhakti radhokshaje ahetukya vyavahita yatma suprasiddhati now the savai punsam paro dharmo the word dharma in this context refers to general generally refers to religion or a religious occupation or religious activity of some sort mm. so there are para dharma supreme dharma indicates that there are varieties of dharmas okay. and para indicates that this is a supreme religious occupation so the supreme religion is that by which loving service is obtained to the supreme personality of godhead hmm so here is where we harmonize you say yes bhakti is a kind of service to the lord is a kind of religion but it's a supreme religion it is devoid of the inebriates associated with mundane religiosity it is not tainted with the selfishness that characterizes uh, mundane religion and therefore avyavahita or apratihata ahituki it is causeless meaning it is no material motivation and it is uninterrupted which means consistency we have to keep on doing it and finally when it says you know to satisfy the self it has to be apratihata and ahituki yatma suprasiddhati atma suprasiddhati it pleases the atma the soul the self so this perfection of religion blend seamlessly into the spiritual because now the soul is completely satisfied so the perfection of spirituality the perfected stage of spirituality is when the soul is completely satisfied so here is where religion seamlessly blends in with the spiritual and there is no distinction there when religion reaches its finest spiritual essence it is bhakti your bhakti beautiful so i would say these are the two verses of course there are many more but uh, the two of the more popular uh, and commonly known verses from our bhakti tradition which would harmonize these two terms religion and spirituality right. another verse i thought of is this is beautiful sorry book sampara dharma i just reminded me from the other perspective that if somebody has a concern that religion is narrow minded and i want to i don't want to be narrow minded then sarva dharman prityajya maam ekam sharanam vraja so maam ekam yes. sharanam vraja is the essence and if yes. any conception of religiosity is stopping us from the essence of loving god then yes. that can be given up so Correct. if we, if we want to say spiritual is maam ekam sharanam vraja and religious yes. is anything that stops us from being maapika sharanam raja then yes we have to give up that so in that sense sarva dharma pratyaj maame kam sharanam raja could be a verse which talks about being spiritual and not and not being religious in the sense of not religion not letting religion come in the way of being spiritual that don't let religious yeah. narrow mindedness or sectarianism that come in the way of your spirituality so, yes at one level so it's a so it's just approaching it from a different perspective and yes i would say sarva dharman parityajya is spirituality and also the topmost religion yes and sarva dharman parityajya or rather mam ekam sharanam braja i beg your pardon is yes. the topmost religion and spirituality yeah and sarva dharman parityajya the other dharmas that krishna asks us to give up they represent the lower degrees of religion yes that's true and then so religion has multifarious aspects and is multi leveled 
Yes, that's true. And then there are many verses in the Bhagavatam which are in so many ways quite non-sectarian. If you consider the, uh, if say the spiritual, if those who want to be spiritual, uh, they they are concerned about virtues. Then the virtues of a sadhu that are described, tetikshava karuni ka surudha sarva dehi na ajata shatrava shant sadhava sadhu bhushana. So these are universally appreciable qualities. Somebody who is tolerant, who is compassionate, who is forgiving, who is calm. So at that spiritual level, we will. If now some, if somebody is sectarian, narrow-minded, they can't be tolerant. They can't be peaceful. Yes. They, 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 if I consider you know, that you are, I will want to destroy. If somebody will want to destroy the other person, can't tolerate be peaceful. So these qualities indicate that one has gone beyond the narrow-mindedness of associated with religion. That that some people associate with religion. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. And the earlier point about individuality. I was just reading uh, Gopal Champu, and there, uh, in an explanation of that, it is described that uh, in the Gopi Gita, it is the plural is used, Gopya Uchuhu, that the Go the Gopis speak. But Jiva Goswami explains that each of the verses in the Gopi Gita is spoken by one one Gopi, different Gopis. Yes. So each Gopi is speaking. She is expressing her own heart, but at the same time, she is also representing the group. So yes. there is both individuality and community coming together. Each gopi expresses her heart's devotion and longing for Krishna to come back into their associate into their association once again. But at the same time, the gopi is also ex the gopi is also expressing the longing of the whole community. So individuality is not lost. But in a sense, individuality is purely manifested in the community of uh, those who are spiritualists. So we could say what we what people often consider as their individuality is associated often with their conditionings. Now, you say I want to be my individual. That means I want to dress like that. I want to put a cap like that. I want to put a goggles like this. So these are very peripheral to us. The real individuality is not the individual associated with the body and the mind, but the individual associated with the soul, and that manifests purely in the path of bhakti and its perfection. Yes, the perfection of individuality is expressed at the stage of topmost devotion, and yes. each devotee has a unique personal relationship with Krishna. Hmm. That is where the individualism is protected, nurtured. Valued even by Krishna, and therefore you will find even in a particular group, there are many individuals with different moods. So there is a lot of diversity in the spiritual world, as there is here. And Prabhupada makes this point many times. Uh, variegatedness and diversity exists completely across the spiritual world. There are different mellows. And even within each mellow, there are different uh, varieties there. Since you spoke about the gopis, there are different groups of gopis. Yes. Each of a certain mood, and even within that particular group, then there are so many with slightly varying, you know, individual traits. So there is so much diversity. There's so much expression of individuality in bhakti, mm. but ultimately there is a unity. That unity is because of their pure devotion for Krishna. So the ultimate perfection of unity and diversity mm. resides here in pure devotion. So there is individuality and there is collectivism. Yes, there are groups, but there is also individuality. When you try to have one extreme or the other, then you end up uh, with some kind of an imbalance. Yes, and even uh, you know, just to give a, a slightly uh, tangential remark, but the same thing when reflected in political and economic philosophies in the world today also. You have the modern capitalist liberal democracies going to one extreme of being individ of individual freedom, and you yes. have the the communist kind of commune oriented systems which are extremely collectivist in orientation. They represent the two extremes. 
But the Vedic tradition essentially represents a harmony between the individual and the collective, mm. a suitable blend of the two. So that should also be our uh, social philosophy because ultimately what is found in this world is also a kind of a reflection of what's there in the spiritual world. That was just an incidental comment about individualism, yes, but yes. Hmm. So just, uh, yes. actually this could be a whole elaborate subject about how in the political world or in today's world, how the two extremes of individuality and community go in different directions, extremes, but uh, one concern which uh, people have about losing their individuality when they start practicing a religion is that if I just start doing everything that everyone else is doing, if I start thinking and believing what everyone else is doing, then will that make me lose my individuality? So my uh, going back to the earlier metaphor of medicine, it's if, if, if say a dozen people are sick, then they all at one level follow a standard treatment if they have a similar sickness. But once they become healthy, then each of them will have their own life, their own career, their own personality, and that will manifest automatically. So the standardization of the treatment is not meant to, meant to suppress their individuality. It is actually meant to restore their health and energy, and there their individuality can manifest in a, in a natural way. So excellent, in the excellent analogy. Sorry? Excellent analogy. And Srila Prabhupada also spoke about this many times about the jaundice, you know, yeah. sugar cane juice and the jaundice. So the same kind of analogy. That's very appropriate. Mm. So, uh, and maybe... actually, if, uh, if, the, if a sick person decides that why should I listen to a doctor? You know, I'll just do whatever I like myself. Uh, that person might well end up harming himself or herself more, even bravely perhaps. Yeah. So also on the spiritual path, out of some kind of a fear for following some authority or conforming to some group, if an individual tries to just experimentally, speculatively, whimsically uh, try to find some chart out his or her own path, then it's very risky. Yeah, and, and it's not just to end up uh, how many person. Yes, Maharaj. And just taking this point further, it's not just what to speak of charting out some other path. Even if they follow the limbs of a right path, but without proper guidance, that can also backfire. It's like if I take the right medicine, but I don't take it under prescription. I might take it too much. I might take it too little. So there is yeah. that verse. That Shruti Smriti Purana di Pancharatri ki vidim vina, Aikanti ki harer bhakti utpata yayakalpati. So it's significant, it is saying that you are doing harer bhakti only. We are doing some kind the person is doing some kind of devotion only, but even devotion can cause disruption individually and socially. So it's like even a medical treatment can have contraindicative effects and uh, there can be so, so the right process has to be followed with the right guidance. Correct. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. Therefore, that one Paribhasha Sutra, uh, that defining Sutra of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is this Anyabhilashita Shunyam thing, mm -hmm. verse. Because it, in, it covers all these points. That you have to be under guidance, it has to be following the footsteps of the Acharyas, it has to be with Krishna, it has to be done favorably, you know, it has to be without material mm -hmm. motives. So everything is encapsulated in that one verse. Yes, yes. I never thought of the, I knew about analytical elements of that verse, but if we put it in the uh, metaphor of a therapy, then everything fits in beautifully. Yes, yes. Nukulena Krishna Nushilanam. Yeah. Uh, so maybe one last question I had. While one is practicing bhakti, we know that ultimately the individuality will manifest at a pure level. But while one is practicing bhakti, how much room is there for one to express one's individuality? So is it that some people who come from a more individualistic ethos, they will find it excessively difficult to practice bhakti 
and those who come from a, a society or a country where or a culture where it is more of community centered and they will find it easier to practice bhakti and can bhakti also be can bhakti practice also be customized to accommodate the needs of or the backgrounds of particular people um let's continue with the analogy of the medical treatment yes um the question is with regard to uh, how much they follow right how much the they? individual they follow yeah description of the doctor yes yes uh, the doctor may, may prescribe something and the person says well i'll follow only this much someone says i'll follow that much so then obviously the results will be different hmm so uh, yes there may be a reluctance to to accept the orders of the doctor but then at, to that degree one's cure will also be impeded and delayed okay so to the degree that one is uh, following a bona fide authority hmm perfectly and strictly to that degree the cure will be quicker and more effective so there is a certain frame of reference there is a certain boundary okay which you know we 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 are supposed to be within like you have to chant your 16 rounds a certain principles that we have to follow minimum chanting the holy name you know you have to do this you have to do that so there are certain things that we all have to follow but within that there is room for individuality somebody likes dt worship they do a lot of more dt worship than perhaps some other services someone is more inclined to doing a particular another kind of service and that devotee does that type of service you know so so therefore there is a lot of room for individuality in bhakti within the framework of the directions and instructions given by the acharyas yes that is true but it cannot be without any restrictions or boundaries yes. that cannot be so in one sense our purpose is fixed that we are meant to serve krishna and devote ourselves to krishna yes. the specifics of how exactly we may serve that may vary from person to person yes and it could be that some people may decide that if they don't want to follow that strictly in in one sense shri prabhupad also created the program of life membership so for those who were not yet ready to be committed enough to do sadhana then he created some connection for them also but that would be more like a very gradual a small dosage and a very gradual treatment and gradual recovery but somebody who takes the more intense treatment they recover much faster yes so the, so the purpose is one but the specifics can vary yes to some extent yes yeah. um, so maybe i'll just summarize and then you have any further points to say about any other related points uh not for now no okay so we were discussing about the topic of spiritual but not religious and then broadly we had three parts the first part was you know why why are people concerned about why do people want to be spiritual but not religious then what's deficient about it and how the bhakti wisdom can address those deficiencies and concerns so the first part we discussed elaborately so one point was that people are suspicious about institutionalized religion because often that leads to materialism and they are more concerned with experiences and virtues rather than uh dogmas and uh, rituals and then you mentioned that it is also the individualistic liberal spirit where people want to do their own thing and not follow any authority that that is the root of spiritual but not religious then we contrasted the abrahamic religions primarily christianity with with eastern traditional traditions and there is to some extent disillusionment with the western religions and the mystique associated with the eastern traditions that attracts people to come and also the eastern traditions of offer more of a tradition of philosophical inquiry and personal experiences rather than simply 
following some rules or believing certain doctrines and we discussed about the history of institutionalization even within our traditions that uh, shankaracharya and buddhism and even before that ramayana we had uh, the hermitages the monasteries so in our particular tradition uh, institutionalization in the form of a of a authority structure author former authority structure was from from bhakti vinod thakur and bhakti sanjay thakur but chaitanya mahaprabhu himself was also concerned about uh, doctrinal purity and um, so we discussed that two things about why in, while institutionalization can lead to deviation and uh, Bhaktisan Thakur has compared it to Putana and Kamsa, but he also created institution. So for two main reasons why we need it. One is for an individual to practice anything spiritual, especially in today's world where there is no atmosphere of spirituality, that is alone is very difficult. Like a drop of water or a trickle of water on the top of a mountain to alone get to the ocean is almost impossible. And secondly, for for them to be able to practice and for them to have something to practice the process and its uh, principles to be purely available somebody has to have a uh, somebody has to act like a guardian and we discussed that after chaitanya mahaprabhu departed and whenever there were no guardians then there were periods of uh, deviations and then the subsequent acharyas like vishwanath shikha thakur or bhakti thakur had to come and uh, Uh, restore the pure teaching so for the access for the process practicing the process and for having a process to practice institutionalization is not only important but even essential and uh, then we went into the discussion of how while practicing while having the institutionalization how can uh, what what we came to the, the second part was that what's deficient is you not able to practice the third part was uh, how our tradition com- uh, complements the the deficiencies or removes counter the deficiencies of sbnr ideas so you discussed two verses anya bilasha tasunyam which talks about how we need to so for we discussed various meanings of the word spiritual often it's quite vague but you said it could refer to sambandha abhidhe and prayojan clarity about understanding then having a process to practice and then getting some experiences through that process and so it is possible to be religious without being spiritual one can be ritualistic and not experience much transformation now to be spiritual without being religious if it means that one wants to be open minded and narrow mind not narrow minded that is definitely possible in our tradition because we do hold that we are following a particular path to say climb up the mountain spiritual consciousness but we acknowledge there are other paths also but if spiritual but not religious means that we will not follow anything at all then it's like saying i am sick and i want to become healthy but i won't take any treatment then you won't become healthy so what makes one what makes one's religious practice spiritual is three things one is the commitment and consistent practice second is the proper conception of what is it that we are trying to attain who is it that we are trying to worship and then the proper consciousness or motivation of why we are approaching that person and all these three are encapsulated in anya abhidhya verse and then you also mentioned the savai pum sampara dharma verse which talks about the pure transcendental level of uh, religion where it has merged into spirituality then i talked about sarva dharma pratyaj jamam ekam sharanam raja where mam ekam sharanam raja is essentially spiritual and not religious in the sense that not narrow minded dogmatic sectarian which stops us from being spiritual that is give it up sarva dharma and pratyaj and then we talked about last part we talked about was, was can individuality and spirituality go together individuality and religious practice go together so we discussed that at this pure spiritual level the individuality flourishes fully while in a community so the gopi geeta where each gopi is offering the prayer and is also representing the, com- the community of gopis that was ex- ex- that was an example and then talk about during the practice there is a certain level of commitment required but that doesn't suppress one's individuality just like a sick person following a rigid treatment their individuality is not suppressed rather once they are healed their individuality will manifest thereafter and if somebody feels that individuality is being suppressed right now then there are different levels at which 
people's practice can be accommodated and depending on how much serious one is in the practice then one will progress that faster so overall krishna consciousness offers us the facility of being spiritual and religious both anything i left out maharaj and especially the connection between spirituality and religion that the, the spirituality is the they find a sense of religion yes. and religion in its topmost and purest form is nothing but pure spirituality yes and where these two meet is the path of devotion to krishna yes. path of pure devotion yes maharaj yeah thank you very much maharaj for your time it's a very stimulating discussion yeah look forward to having you again yes. in future thank you chetan acharan prabhu thank you very much this session on a very important topic of relevance in the modern day yes maharaj thank you okay thank you thank you hari krishna, krishna. rila prabhu pad ki jai hari krishna thank you hari krishna